Okay, welcome back. Today, we are going to be continuing along through Jim Garrison's Carrie Thornley Files. I believe this is part six. Um, just to give you a kind of uh, an idea of how in-depth these document reviews are going to be, uh, I think we're going to have probably 15, 16 um, streams uh, just on Carrie Thornley. And then we will move on to what will be a surprise, because it's going to be fucking incredible. And uh, those combined streams, uh, these Carrie Thornley files and what I bring you next, will bring me to the conclusion of my book. Um, and so, yes, I'm rather excited. It's uh, all coming together. So, all right. <clears throat> Let us continue. Um, all right, in the upper right here, we have Barbara Reed. Um, Barbara Reed was an associate of Carrie Thornley's. Okay, so um, what this is going to be about is uh, associates of Carrie Thornley who have either met Oswald or saw Oswald in places where Carrie Thornley is known to have frequented. Um, so we're trying to establish a couple things here. We're trying to establish the relationship between Oswald and Thornley. We're also trying to establish uh, that... Thornley was uh, mistaken for Oswald uh, on many occasions, um, in either inadvertently or intentionally. And uh, yeah, this uh, this batch of uh, documents in the Garrison Files is pretty uh, pretty incredible. Conveniently left out of the uh, official narrative or narratives. <clears throat> All right, so reference uh, Carrie Thornley note at first glance, this appears to be solely Oswald material. However, um, something this into the Ryder Coffee House also our interesting Solzer lead, JR or JG. Um, her meeting with Oswald at the Ryder Coffee House. Uh, and here he's referencing Daphne Stapleton. Uh, Daphne Stapleton, uh, uh, an associate of Carrie Thornley, or a girlfriend at one time. Uh, same thing with Barbara Glancy Reed. Um, okay, so this is dated... Uh, September 25th, 1968. On Wednesday, September 25th, 1968, at 1.30 p.m., a Scambria and I... Um, who is I here? Uh, I will get to it. It's one of Garrison's guys. A Scambria and I arrived at the house of Daphne Stapleton, uh, 235 Dexter Avenue, Mobile, Alabama. Daphne's mother came to the door and recognized Scambria immediately. She informed us that Daphne was ill and that she could not see us. Um, she also said that she, Mrs. Stapleton, would not let her, Daphne, talk to us. It was only after agreeing with her about the doubtful morals of some of Daphne's former friends that Mrs. Stapleton agreed to let me come in and talk with her daughter. This was also only after I had given her the impression that I was a former friend of her daughter's. As it was, when Scambria and I returned to the house after her stipulated delay of 15 minutes to give Daphne time to make herself presentable, 
Some of Mrs. Stapleton's reservations had returned because she said that Daphne couldn't remember me. Not surprising because Daphne and I had never met. As soon as I went in the house, Daphne was most friendly and obviously prepared to be cooperative. The only problem was the mother, who kept interrupting and telling Daphne it wasn't smart to get involved. I had taken the Ryder Coffeehouse guest book and a stack of photographs of various crowd shots of quarter activities in the hopes that Daphne would spot some familiar faces and that it might trigger associations, because she did say at the beginning she was familiar with the Bourbon House, and in some respects the crowds did overlap. Um, so, if you saw some of my previous broadcasts, uh, the Bourbon House was often frequented by Carrie Thornley. However, there are a lot of witnesses who say that they saw Lee Harvey Oswald there. There are other people who said that they saw Thornley meeting with Oswald there, and then there are people who I believe thought they saw Oswald, but saw Carrie Thornley. So the Bourbon House is a clusterfuck of misidentifications. Um, I just pray to fucking God that William Seymour never hung out there, because that would throw another fucking wrench into the mix. Unfortunately, Daphne had been to the Oculist <laughs> the day before. Uh, I thought it said occultist for a second, but the Oculus the day before, and because of the drops used, was unable to focus either to see pictures or read the guest book. That sounds like a complete crock of bullshit. Uh, Daphne immediately started discussing her meeting with Oswald, saying that she was sure that the that, that was the most important thing to us, and that then I could ask her anything I wanted to, that she was willing to cooperate in any way possible. She stated this firmly over her mother's continual audible objections and over wallings, wailings, whatever. It looks like some 1960s word we don't use anymore. Um, so let me reread this. Daphne immediately started discussing her meeting with Oswald, saying that she was sure that was the most important thing to us and that I could ask her anything I wanted to. So she's singling out this incident where she met Oswald. Um... Okay, so Daphne's unable to help because she went to the eye doctor and got drops and she can't see any of the pictures uh, or read the guest book or none of that stuff. But she can tell them everything about her meeting with Oswald. Okay, so this is another planted story, like right off the bat. It was around 9 a.m. on a summer morning, quite warm, and Daphne was sitting on the steps reading a book of short stories by Henry James and had reached the story, um, what does that say? Altar of the Dead? Well, whatever. Uh, when she was joined by Patty Gleason, who with her husband had an apartment in the same building. Daphne was very conscious of the time because she was waiting for the mail delivery and a check from her mother. She said the reason for Patty remaining there was also the mail delivery, and though it wasn't specifically mentioned to Daphne, uh, was sure she was waiting for a check, too. We both usually were in the same position. Our husbands were alike. Uh, a red sports car pulled to a stop and a young man got out. Daphne said, I don't know what kind it was, but it wasn't an MG because I like MGs. I asked her if she liked the looks of this car, and she said yes. I asked her if the top was down, and she said, if it was, it must have been dark, meaning the top. Obviously, the top was down because Daphne was sitting up on the steps, and looking down, she saw the woman who was driving quite clearly. Her first thought was, why would a mother be bringing her son to this place? Because there was no hesitation uh, there parts. She described the woman as being in her 40s wearing sunglasses, and her overall impression was disapproval at the woman's appearance, both in dress and in the way she wore her hair. Daphne said she immediately thought mother would call her cheap. I asked her what made that thought pop into her mind, and she said it was her hair. It was gray, silver, and it was too short. I can't read that. Um, not fomenting. 
uh, but mannish. Or not feminine, but mannish. There we go. Mother hates processed hair. And you could tell this woman had just had a permanent. Kind of kinky up there. Um, having her hand around the top of crown of her head. Uh, here, mother and daughter pause to argue about the process, uh, about the processing methods. Uh, the day before, Daphne had also gone to a beauty shop where they had over-processed her hair, which explained the reticence about being seen by anyone. Mm-hmm. So the day before, Daphne had also gone to a beauty shop where they had overprocessed her hair, which explained her reticence to anybody seeing her. Uh, that doesn't really. I'm trying to figure that out. There's some significance there. Um, but it'll it'll come to me later. Oswald closed the car door and the woman drove off. He seemed to know exactly where he was, and came straight up the steps. She was conscious of thinking he certainly didn't belong in a car like that because the clothes he was wearing were so old and worn. Short sleeve patterned sports shirt and black slacks. Hmm. Short sleeve patterned sport shirt and black slacks. But she emphasized how fresh, cleaned, and pressed they were. Such old clothes to be so clean and not wrinkly anywhere. I felt so sorry for him. Because a person like that is proud. This I didn't get to elaborate upon because of the mother. Before he reached her, apparently one of her kittens got loose. Of the name El Blato. <laughs> As she tried to catch the cat, he asked her, is Jack here? Daphne said no, and then Oswald caught the cat and walked back toward Howard Cohen's apartment. So she's identifying this guy who pulled up in the red convertible sports car. <clears throat> As Lee Harvey Oswald. But remember, this is in the Carrie Thornley files. So Garrison didn't believe this was Oswald, and I don't believe it was Oswald either. So the person came asking for Jack. It's Jack Frazier. Jack Frazier ran the um, Ryder Coffee House. Uh, former CIA, obviously running a CIA front. Um, this, to me, I believe is clearly Kerry Thornley. Again, being identified as Oswald. But not accidentally. Right? So she's telling a story here. But let's refer back to the fact that she can't look at the pictures or doesn't know anything else, but she'd be more than happy to talk about her interaction with Oswald. And then she tells the story of Oswald wanting to interact with Jack Frazier, being driven there by a woman in her 40s. Um, now, if that is Lee Harvey Oswald, you have to ask yourself, what woman in their 40s was he allegedly associated with at that time? And I'll tell you, the answer is none. Ruth Payne was in her 20s. Um, Marina didn't drive. Oswald didn't drive. This is obviously a connection of Carrie Thornley. Oswald cradled the cat saying, I like pets, I prefer dogs, but I sure like cats too. I asked her if she had noticed his hair, and she said yes, that it was very neat and well cut. Uh, they talked a while. Unfortunately, the mother interspersed with, if you know something, that's when you should keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and Daphne overrode her, continuing with, he said he was cold. It's so cold. He said, I'm so cold. I thought he must be sick or something because it was such a warm day, and he looked so sad and lonely and unhappy that I felt so sorry for him. He was such a nice boy. I'm always picking up stray cats and dogs, and I wanted to ask him what I could do to help him. At this time, the car driven by the woman returned, and Oswald wrote on a piece of paper, Lee Oswald handed it to her and said, tell Jack I was here. Daphne folded the piece of paper and put it in the book as a bookmark. I asked her if she had given it to Jack, and she said, no, I forgot to give it to him, and I didn't give him the message either. I forgot about it completely. 
it wasn't until after everything happened that I saw the paper again that I even remembered it at all because I'd been because I'd been sick. Here things became confusing because of the idiotic mother trying to drown Daphne out by telling me the details of all of Daphne's miscarriages. But through it all, Daphne was saying with determination, Mother, I'm trying to answer answer her questions. Uh, they aren't interested in that. They know what they want, and if I can help, I'm going to. This is where Bill Sulzer enters into her discourse. Hmm. Bill Sulzer underlined in an arrow. This must have some significance uh, to Garrison. She said she didn't see the paper again until she reopened the book sometime later. Bill Sulzer came to see her in a panic. Uh, don't ever tell them I knew Oswald. Daphne then said, I know he saw him several times. Interruption. All right, I'd swear. I'm positive he'd saw him at least once. He, Bill Sulzer, said he had been with him several times and that he had introduced him, Oswald, to Jack and whatever I did not to mention it to anyone. And that's why I thought it was so strange when Dave Snyder and that other man came to see me because I knew the only way they could have known where I lived was if Bill gave them my address. And I didn't know why he would do that when he had been so scared. And I thought they were from the DAs and they were so awful to me. At this point, Scambrian knocked on the door. And as the mother left the room, I gave Daphne a card with my number on it and said, call any time of day or night. She nodded and tucked it out of sight and her mother returned to room. Uh, both women agreed uh, to my talking to Daphne again, with Daphne apologizing and saying she would be in better shape the next time I came. The mother made it quite clear. There wasn't a man on earth she trusted, and she would be satisfied for all men to stay away and not bother Daphne. However, I was welcome to come back any time. As I started out the door, Daphne continued talking about Bill, saying that Bill had gone to Jack and told him not to talk about the meeting but uh, told Jack that Jack had introduced Oswald to him. Hmm. Referring to Bill. So allegedly Jack Frazier introduced Oswald to Bill Sulzer. Mm -mm. Nah, don't buy it. It's all Carrie Thornley. Uh, Daphne said Jack was so upset that that she thought he had gone to the FBI to tell them he never met Oswald, but that it seemed the man who seemed to know about Oswald would be Sulzer. Upon our return to New Orleans, I talked to Jack Frazier that same evening. I asked him if he approached the FBI, and he said he'd not, that they had come to him and asked him about a trip to Mexico that he had made with Howard Cohen in January of 1963. He insists that as far as he knows, he never did meet Oswald but does not rule out the possibility. He seemed to feel that Daphne was completely credible and I didn't detail anything to him. He feels a sense of uh, protectiveness for Solzer, or at least appears to. It seems Daphne would be worth talk, uh, talking to some more if only to find out more about the note and whether she still has it. Even though Daphne was in a very nervous state to extent that continually sh uh, of shaking hands, it might be attributable to her mother's presence, as it seems she might be different in other surroundings. Hmm. Interesting stuff. All right. Uh, memo. Marked May 29th, 1968, with the name Gallo circled on it to Jim Garrison, district attorney from Andrew Scambria, assistant district attorney. Reference Norman J. Gallo, employee at Napoleon Avenue Branch Library. So still, I'm going to reiterate the theme here is that Jim Garrison knew that Oswald was being impersonated or mistaken uh, for or intentionally mistaken for, which is what it seems to be um, with that uh, uh, former, uh, with that planted story that we just went over, right? So to me, that's a clearly a planted story since she didn't want to talk about anything else. Um, this is more uh, substantiation for the notion that all of Oswald's activities in fucking New Orleans were Carrie Thornley. 
I, there were definitely a couple that were William Seymour, like the one at the Havana Lounge, uh, where Oswald's like puking and wearing a bow tie and shit. Like clearly William Seymour with the uh, husky Latino with the pockmarked face. Uh, so yeah, so both of these guys, Carrie Thornley and William Seymour, were active in New Orleans and in Dallas. And in Dallas. I think that we will, at some point in these Thornley files over the next couple of days, get to some of Thornley's activities as Oswald, or where he was mistaken for Oswald, um, in Dallas, where he's shooting rifles at bales of hay off the fucking highway like a moron. I swear to God, Carrie Thornley is like the dumbest fucking person that has ever, ever walked the earth. <laughs> oh, man. Barbara Reed, uh, again, an associate or former girlfriend or friend or something of Carrie Thornley <coughs> relayed the following information to me concerning Norman J. Gallo. He's 36 years old, a native New Orleans, graduated from Warren Easton and Tulana, uh, or Tulane University, has a BA in journalism, is married, and his wife is a native of Tokyo. Entered the Air Force in 1953, spent some time at Lowry Field in Denver, <clears throat> approximately two years, went into the Air Force as a first lieutenant, uh, went to Texas base near Fort Worth. At Lackland Air Force Base, he received special training and stated to friends that he was uh, with Air Force Intelligence, and as part of his job, he briefed pilots before missions. All total, he was in the Air Force twice uh, and worked for the federal government twice. On re-enlisting in the Air Force, he was sent to Korea for two years, and it was one of these trips to Tokyo that he met his wife. He had some trouble getting his wife out of Tokyo and had to contact Congressman Hebert uh, for help. He arrived in New Orleans with his wife in 1963. Well, what does this say here? Uh, good chance to check. Um, okay. So from 1957 to 1959, he worked for the federal government in Washington, D.C., and he would never reveal the nature of his work. In December of 59, he returned to New Orleans and went to work for Dunn and Bradstreet. He left New Orleans in May of 1960 and went to San Francisco. <laughs> I smell intelligence. Uh, and from San Francisco went on to Tokyo. He returned to the United States and went to work for Dun & Bradstreet again in Fresno, California for approximately one year. He then left Fresno, California and went back to Tokyo and remained in Tokyo until around October of 1961. He returned back to New Orleans alone in the spring of 62. During his stays in Japan, he taught English to Japanese students and also spoke Italian and Spanish. He had a great fondness for World War II German generals. Don't we all? Um, in New Orleans, uh, he went to work for the New Orleans Public Library. Mmm, an intelligence guy goes to work at the library. Mm-hmm. Wonder why. Um, in New Orleans, he went to work for the New Orleans Public Library and worked for a while at the Harrison and Canal Boulevard branch. He then took a leave of absence and returned to Tokyo in order to get his bride and returned with her in 1963 to New Orleans. He was shuffled around various branches of the New Orleans Public Library. Tommy Griffin gave him a little write-up in his column during the summer of 1963. He was working at the Napoleon Avenue branch of the Public Library and lived in the 7,000 block of St. Charles Avenue. He also worked with a bookmobile. Uh, he was known to have visited the Quorum Club a few times around August or September of 1964. He had discussed Oswald being in the Napoleon Avenue branch and checking out books. Shortly after the assassination, he was scoffing at press releases about Oswald being the lone assassin and said that there had to be a conspiracy. He made no comment concerning the type of person Oswald was. He stayed with the New Orleans library system until January of 1965. He then went to LSU in Baton Rouge to work on a master's in library science. In September of 66, he was working in the Jefferson Parish library system and still living in the 7,000 block of St. Charles. When he left New Orleans, he left no forwarding address and was believed to be going to the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, his father, A. Gallo, lives in Jefferson Parish and his uncle, uh, Signorelli, lives on Canal Boulevard and has something to do with the Rockery Inn. Uh, he is described as quiet, uh, shied away from parties, around 5'9", 155 pounds, slender, 
has his picture in the 53 Tulane yearbook. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> that will not be difficult to find. Has an oriental looking face, olive complexion, has black hair and brown eyes. He is balding in the front, sometimes wears glasses. He is described as a moody type person. Likes to read, including the classics and political writings. Likes classical music and is a stamp collector. He is described as paranoid in the same sense uh, that he says his phone is always tapped and that he's being followed and watched. He has no homosexual tendencies. Hmm. Interesting. That's that's interesting. It seems to be a one-off. Just dropped in there. Uh, and probably seldom referenced ever again. So, yeah. That's on the to-do list for sure. Uh, Mr. Wilcox. Uh, this is dated uh, Dallas, Texas, December 4th, 63. Uh, Mr. Wilcox, this statement refers to a portion of Mr. Hamblin's written statement dated December 2nd in which Mr. Hamblin stated that he recalls I had trouble paying a money order to a man named Oswald several weeks ago because the payee did not have proper identification. That Oswald was informed to get some identification and return and he would be paid. Uh, that he did return an hour later with a Navy identification card and a library card and was paid a small sum of money. Very interesting. I do recall relieving Mr. Archie... What is that, Roll On Tuesday, October 29th, on the early night money order position while Mr. Roll was relieving Mr. Rodwell during the last week, or Mrs. Rodwell during the last week of her vacation. As I recall, I did have a difficulty paying a small money order to a man who struck me as being a feminine type person. However, I cannot remember his name. The reason I happen to recall the incident out of the great number of money orders paid by me at the front counter is because he gave so much trouble regarding such a small amount of money. While I do not remember the name of the payee, I do recall it was delivered to someone at the YMCA on North Irve Street. I also recall the payee of the money order in question was accompanied by another man of Spanish descent. Here we go again with the man of Spanish descent. Okay, so back to the man of Spanish descent. Are we talking about Lawrence Howard, uh, who was accompanying William Seymour all over fucking Dallas and New Orleans and elsewhere? Um, or are we talking about... Um, Carrie Thornley being accompanied by one of the more irrelevant uh, Cubans like um, Louis Rebel, right? Um, that's a possibility. And when you, all you have is the description of a man of Spanish descent, it's kind of fucking hard to make a determination. So this goes in the like up in the air category. Is this Carrie Thornley or is this William Seymour? Or is it Carrie Thornley with Lawrence Howard? Because that's the possibility, right? Um, so who knows? So let's keep going on. Um, this is from Aubrey Lee Lewis. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is Dallas, Dallas, Texas, December 4th, 1963. That was the statement date, but it was October 29th. So October 29th in the early night, money order position. Okay. So October 29th, someone's staying at the YMCA. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this is not Carrie Thornley. This is William Seymour and Lawrence Howard. Um, there is an indication that these guys did, in fact, stay at a YMCA, um, the same YMCA that Jack Ruby was known to have visited at times. But I'm going to have to, I need some more refinement on that because that didn't make it into my first book. Um, that I'll have to revisit. Um. Wilcox exhibit, what is that, 3006? Yeah. Exhibit number 3015 on disposition of, I can't read that, look, is that maybe Lacombe, uh, um, oh, uh, Lauren, some, this, uh, Wilcox guy, it's a deposition of Wilcox uh, on Dallas, Texas, 331-64, okay, that's what this is. Um, personal confidential, Mr. Hemmingson, it looks like, uh, please refer to 
previous letters, December 2nd, December 3rd, regarding the recent newspaper article in the Times Herald with reference to the Oswald case. Following is a brief uh, resume regarding the search of our files for any telegrams sent by our money orders received by Lee Harvey Oswald. A news article appears in the Dallas Times Herald, November 30th, 1963, stating that Oswald received small amounts of money ranging up to $10 or possibly $20 at a time via Western Union for several months prior to the assassination of President Kennedy. That Oswald sent a telegram himself printed in a curious a crowded script only a few days before the assassination and that Oswald was remembered at Western Union because he invariably argued with those employees who assisted him. Uh, copies of these newspaper articles are attached. After the article appeared in the Times Herald November 30th, we were besieged by inquiries from the press, Dallas Police, FBI, and U.S. Secret Service for more definite information than that which appeared in the Times Herald. Uh, Clark uh, discounts a Shaw conspiracy article from the New York Times, uh, Friday, March 3rd, 1967. Okay, so uh, this is an article by Robert B. Semple Jr., um, special to the New York Times. So this is a New York Times article, Washington, March 2nd. Acting Attorney General Ramsey Clark said today that the basis of inquiry is by the Federal Bureau of Investigation that there appeared to be no connection between Clay L. Shaw and the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Clark uh, made this statement to newsmen in a corridor of Senate office building moments after Senate Judiciary Committee unanimously approved his nomination as Attorney General, of course, the payoffs are coming. All right, so there's only one paragraph here that's kind of outlined, so let me back up and read the paragraph before it. Um, it says, an examination of papers in the archives, for example, shows that the FBI did an inquiry uh, into the activities of a man named Clay Bertrand. Mr. Garrison says that Clay Bertrand was an alias used by Mr. Shaw. If this is so, and Clay Bertrand and Mr. Shaw are the same man, it is thought then that the Bureau did indeed inquire into the activities of Mr. Shaw. A Justice Department official said tonight that his agency was convinced that Mr. Bertrand and Mr. Shaw were the same man and that this uh, was the basis for Mr. Clark's assertion this morning. Hmm. Interesting. We can move on from there. What is this? Um, criminal District Court for the Parish of New Orleans. Uh, Clay Shaw, judgment of the court. This is the Clay Shaw judgment. Uh, the court finds that sufficient evidence has been presented to establish probable cause that a crime has been committed and further that sufficient evidence has been presented to the jury, uh, presented to justify bringing into play further steps of the criminal process against Arrestee Clay Shaw. The defendant is released on his present bond. Okay, so these are the initial charging documents saying that there's enough probable cause. Um... All right. Memorandum, March 14th, 1967, to Louis Ivan from George Eckert. Uh, this is in regards to a Dakota single action revolver, barrel four and five, five eighths inches, caliber 357 Magnum, serial number 5361, gun manufactured in Italy. Imported April 16th, 1965, by Intercontinental Arm Company. Shipped to Vicks Guns in Galveston, Texas. Uh, then shipped to Walter Craig in Fort Lauderdale, on Fort Lauderdale Street in Selma, Alabama. July 18th, shipped to Chalmette Shooter Supply in Chalmette, Louisiana. The owners of Chalmette Shooter Supply are John Breland and Gaston Moreau. I don't understand the relevance of this gun yet. I spoke with Mr. Moreau over the telephone and he told me he was the part owner of the Chalmette Shooter Supply, and he was uh, put out of business by Hurricane Betsy in 1965. He told me most of the shop's records was, were destroyed by the flood waters. However, he would make an attempt to trace the gun in question. Later, I received a call from Mr. Moreau, who told me that after the hurricane, he and his partner divided the stock, and he believes he got the pistol in question, and he traded it at a later date in Slidell, Louisiana, at a gun show.
Hmm. Interesting. I don't understand the relevance here. Telephone conversation with Dean Andrews. Dean Andrews had informed that Lee Harvey Oswald frequented the Society Page Bar 100 block of Exchange Place. He suggested that we speak to the following people, Martha Howard, Ricky Porter, David Ryder, Ray Potter, Billy Daltman, and Bobby, last name unknown, barmaid at the Society. He suggested that we could locate most of the people through Martha Howard. Uh, who might be located through Dee's Hideaway somewhere in the vicinity of Dauphine Street and St. Anne. Also, Andrews suggested we speak to a man by the name of Wright. This is the same individual who struck the reporter outside of Clayshaw's apartment on the night it was searched. His full name and address can be ascertained from police records since he was charged with simple battery as a result of the aforementioned incident. Frank Willis, September 28, 1966, interview by Scalandria and uh, Thompson. He traded a CB set for rifle. The CB set was worth 225. The rifle was a Winchester bolt action 253,000, roughly 25 caliber. The gun was uh, six thousandths of an inch smaller than 6.5. I took him out to the gun range. I fired a target from 100 yards and got within one inch of the center. He then took the gun, he loaded four bullets, and then fired. You could cover all of them on the target. Uh, with a half a dollar. He fired as if he had handled the gun all his life. He was an educated rifle shot. The man came back to visit Frank Willis. Uh, the Sunday following the assassination, he gave me a um, a Dallas paper about the assassination from his car and said, uh, get rid of this paper for me. I have a picture of him in the Thunderbird. I'll send it to you. I don't know what he's talking about there. Some miscellaneous stuff, but obviously, um, but obviously, Garrison thought there was some relevance here. Hmm. Memorandum, uh, February 28th, 1967, from uh, Scambria and Louis Ivan to Jim Garrison. Interview with David Ferry. Oh, I love David Ferry. All the interviews with him are just fantastic. Uh, the guy can't fucking remember thing. He just trips over his own words. It's crazy. On Saturday, February 18th, 67, at approximately 3.30 p.m., Louis Ivan and I interviewed David Ferry in his apartment uh, on Louisiana Avenue Parkway. As we approached the house, Ferry came out on the porch and looked at us and began to walk down the steps to open the front door for us. As he opened the door for us, he told Ivan that he was glad that we finally decided to come and talk with him and he'd been trying to get in touch with Garrison or Ivan for several days. Uh, he told me hello and asked me what I was doing with Ivan and I explained to him that I was an assistant DA now and thought that I would come along with Ivan since we knew each other from the airport. So yeah, Louis Ivan's name popped up on some arrest affidavits from years prior involving David Ferry. So uh, Louis Ivan, who's uh, working with the DA's office now, is... Um, uh, already aware of who David Ferry is, I believe from his Eastern Airlines shenanigans. Once inside the apartment, Ivan and I sat down and Ferry lay down on the sofa in the front room. He was wearing pants and a t-shirt and had two pillows under him. There was a young man in the apartment in his early 20s who was a friend of Ferry's from Lakefront Airport. His name is Bert Johnson and I remember him from when I was working out there. Uh, Ferry had given him flying instructions and told me that he had already acquired his license. Uh, my first conversation with Ferry centered around airport talking about people we both knew from the airport. He said that he had often wondered what had happened to me and that he thought I had gone into private practice. He said he knew a lot of XDAs and they were all dumb with a few exceptions. <laughs> uh, he then said the reason that he had called us <clears throat> was that he was getting concerned over our investigation. Uh, he had heard all kinds of rumors that he was going to get arrested and that he wanted to find out if these rumors were true. He said that a result of, of these rumors, he had been asked to leave the airport and now he was concerned over how he was going to make a living, that flying was his only enjoyment in life. Ferry said he was suffering from encephalitis and that he could not get any rest because of the radio, TV, and uh, press boys hounding him to death. Ferry said his uh, phone rings from morning till night and that he had talked to Sam DePino from Channel 12 until early hours of the morning. 
Ferry said Sam was trying to con him, but that he was uh, too smart to fall for his line and that all of these people were bastards. Uh, just then the phone rang and it was a reporter from the Times Picayune and he said that he would positively not grant interviews and that he was tired of all those bastards calling him up. The reporter must have told him something because he said that he was not calling him a bastard personally, but he was referring to the news media in general. He then hung up the telephone. Ferry picked up the Picayune paper and said he wanted to show us portions of the story that really disturbed him. He said the newspapers can kill anybody they want to, and that it was never more evident than the case of Carlos Marcello and Jimmy Hoffa. Ferry said the newspapers tried to frame both of these guys, and then talked about Marcello trial that he was working on in 63, and how the newspapers tried to crucify Marcello. <laughs> he said Marcello made asses out of all of them when he was acquitted. Ferry said he wanted to know uh, why we brought Miguel Torres back from Angola. He said that he knew uh, what people would do to get out of prison, and he thought Garrison was trying to frame up by using Miguel Torres. Uh, Ferry said that if this would happen, he would sue us and everybody. Ferry said that he had been contacted by some big attorneys in Washington, D.C., and they wanted to help him. Ferry also said that he did not like the way Garrison was answering questions put to him by newsmen and that Garrison should make a definite statement and not say no comment. He said no comment stirs more shit than an hour's speech. <laughs> Ferry said Garrison knew this and that he was obviously using this for publicity. I assured him that Garrison was not trying to frame anybody and that this was avoiding the press and that he could not say much less to the press than no comment. Uh, then Ferry said he wanted to talk to Garrison personally. Uh, we told him we would try and arrange a meeting in the near future. Ferry then began to curse Jack Martin and said Martin started all of this stuff, which is the fucking God's honest truth. But the question is, who's Jack Martin? That is the question. I'll tell you, I, I think the Jack Martin who made that phone call wasn't Jack Martin, a.k.a. Edward Suggs. I believe that that Jack Martin was Jean-Pierre Lafitte, a.k.a. QJ Wynn, who was in New Orleans all this fucking time the shit was going on. Um, Jack Martin got super dosed with LSD back in 1957 or 58 and uh, when I say super dosed like they super dosed him with liquid LSD okay when you're like a 50 fucking year old dude you ain't never done no acid before and you get super dosed with like fucking a massive amount of liquid LSD bye bye you are not coming back so um, yeah I think a lot of the uh, Jack Martin uh, stuff is actually um, Jean-Pierre Lafitte, not Edward Suggs. But that's going to require require a whole another fucking year of its own study. So Ferry began, then began to curse Jack Martin, said that Martin started all this stuff. Ferry said Martin was jealous of him because of his relationship with G. Ray Gill and that Martin was trying to ruin him. Uh, he said Martin is a screwball and should be locked up. Ferry then said Garrison had better be careful because he knew that some people were trying to torpedo him. That he knew three people on a local level and a couple of people on a national level were trying to ruin him politically and are trying to embarrass him politically with this assassination investigation. Ferry said he did not want to mention the names of the local people, but Garrison should be smart enough to know who they were. He then began to talk about Frank Klein, and he inferred uh, that this man was one of the local persons trying to destroy Garrison. However, when Ivan asked him if Klein was one of the people he was referring to, Ferry said that uh, in time we would find out. Ferry did say that Hoover was one of the people on a national level who was trying to destroy Garrison because Garrison has dared to criticize the Bureau, and that has the whole country wondering if they are as smart as the Keystone Cops. <laughs> That's fucking great. Uh, however, Ferry said that he was glad about this because as far as he's concerned, all cops are bastards, and that has he has no use for any of them. Ferry also said that he heard some people in Washington were walking about or were talking about the investigation and that two days before the story broke in the newspaper, some people were saying that Garrison would call a press conference Friday and give the story to the press. Ferry said he didn't want to give out any name as he didn't want J. Edgar on his ass too. He then asked to speak to Garrison again because he wanted to see if uh, he were serious about the whole thing. I told him that Garrison were, was more than serious and that they were checking on all of our leads and information. I then told Ferry he could tell me what he wanted to say and I would tell Garrison for him. Ferry said he wanted to talk to Garrison himself and look him in the face. I then asked Ferry to tell me where he was on November 22nd, 1963 and how he became so involved in this. All right, this is like my favorite shit in the fucking world. 
I then asked Ferry to tell me where he was on November 22nd. I just hear in the background, dun, 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 right? Like, <laughs> and how he become so involved in this? Well, I'll tell you, because he was on the grassy knoll on November 22nd, 1963. That is the kicker, because fucking Garrison was so close, he had him in his grasp. But he couldn't close the fucking deal, and I don't even know that he actually ever could put uh, Ferry in Dallas. He never knew about the witnesses behind the fucking book depository like Velma. You know? Um, he I, Did he know about Ed Hoffman? Yeah, he had to know about fucking Ed Hoffman because Ed Hoffman um, cooperated with uh, traitor Oliver Stone for the fucking JFK film, right? So and, Gar and Garrison was alive and involved with that too. So, yeah, so he had to fucking know about Ed Hoffman. So, yeah. Maybe he did suspect that Ferry was on the knoll. Who knows? We'll never know now. Ferry said it was all account on a trip uh, he made to Houston, Texas on the afternoon of the 22nd to ice skate. Uh, he said that all he wanted to do was relax after the Marcello trial. This is like fucking comedic gold to me. Uh, and he ha just had the urge to go ice skating. <laughs> he just had the urge to go ice skating at a CIA front on owned by fucking Lyndon Johnson, right? That's hilarious. Uh, Ferry said, as that it turned out, it was the worst trip he'd ever made in his life. It was because he didn't make it. Because he didn't make it. Uh, I asked Ferry what he did in Houston. Ferry said, uh, ice skate, what else? I said, I don't know, Dave, you tell me. Ferry said that I was a newcomer around the game and that my office knew more about the trip than he did. <laughs> Ferry said, ask your boss. He had me arrested when I got back into town. I was booked as a fugitive from Texas and I've never been to Texas. Uh, I asked him to tell me about the arrest and I and uh, as I didn't believe he would arrest a man who was perfectly innocent. <laughs> Ferry told me that I had a lot to uh, learn about life and that I was a starry-eyed kid right out of law school and I was still believing the inscriptions on the courthouse walls. Fucking Ferry, man. Like, when you read between the lines of what he says to these people, Ferry, man, I wish I could have met and known this guy. Not that I respect him. He was a child molester. But fucking, just as a fascinating study of American history, this guy was, as Garrison said, one of the most important people in American history. Uh, Ferry said that after a while when you get a little smarter you'll see that this is a stinking world and that what i told you at the airport is true i told ferry that he what he said may be true but that still doesn't tell me about the arrest ferry said all right i'll go through the spiel again for your benefit ferry said that after he had taken his trip to texas he and boboof and coffee <laughs> uh he and boboof and leighton martins stopped in Alexandria, and he called G. Ray Gill. Uh, Gill told him the police were looking for him and that they wanted to ask him some questions about the assassination. He said that uh, then he drove back to New Orleans and dropped Boboof off at his apartment on Louisiana Avenue Parkway so that he could go upstairs and call some girls for them. <laughs> Please, I doth protest. Um, he said that he and Coffee went to the grocery store. Uh, he said that when he and Coffee were okay, okay, let me make something fucking clear. Okay, there is a Melvin Coffee in the circle on the outskirts of the circle, not involved in any of this shit, and all they ever did was use his name as an alias for Leighton Martins. Period. So anytime you see the name Melvin Coffee, just think Leighton Martins. Okay. Um, he stated that when he and Coffee were returning to the apartment, he noticed a bunch of cars around his apartment and a lot of people. Ferry said he figured it was the police, and so he went back to the store and telephoned. Ferry said some dumb ox answered the phone. <laughs> some dumb ox. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, answered the phone and tried to suck him into a conversation, but he just hung up. Uh, he said uh, he then dropped Coffee off and went to Hammond, Louisiana. I asked, where in Hammond? Ferry said, by a friend. I asked him what friend, and he burst out laughing, said, uh, I'll say one thing for you. You sure try hard. <laughs> oh, that friend is Thomas Compton. Uh, we'll get to him uh, eventually when we get to David Ferry's file. And then we'll spend a fucking month on David Ferry. He then told me not to try and investigate him because he could show me and my whole office how to investigate. I didn't press the issue any further, but later on he told me that he did not stay in a motel, but with a friend who would remain anonymous. Besides, he said, I've got a friend all over, I've got friends all over the world, and that he did. Uh, I said that uh, was uh, very interesting, but that I wanted his opinion on one other small matter. He asked, What? I said, Dave, who shot the president? <laughs> he said, Well, that's an interesting question. I've got my own thought about it. <laughs> 
Ferry then sent his friend into another room to get an anatomy book and a pathology book, and he pulled out a sheet of paper and began to sketch on it. Ferry drew a sketch of the Texascopic Depository and of the parade route and of the area in general. You see, when I read this shit, these fucking guys are confessing without confessing. Can you see that? Fucking arrogant cunts. Uh, Ferry said that before he would uh, definitely draw a conclusion, uh, he would have had more information and facts. Ferry then went on to a long spiel about the trajectory, uh, trajectory, trajectory of bullets in relation to height and distance. Uh, he said that different guns and shells have different trajectories. Okay, okay, all right. So what he's doing is uh, David Ferry is has quite a sense of humor. Okay, so. David Ferry knows sure as fucking shit that there's no word trajectory and that it's trajectory. He knows this, but he's saying trajectory to play stupid while trying to play smart at the same time. This is the kind of fucks that the CIA recruits. Uh, Ferry said that the Warren Commission did not have enough pertinent scientific information to come to an objective conclusion, which is true. He said that he did not read the Warren report, but uh, what he had read proved to him the commission did not know what they were doing exactly. Ferry went into a long spiel about JFK's neck wound because he caused it. Because he sh he's the fucking one who did it. David Ferry fired the first shot from the fucking grassy knoll. That shot. I can't identify the rifle. I don't think it was a fucking Mauser uh, 765. I really don't know what it was. Uh, it had to have been able to be break, broken down and put into a toolbox, though. So that limits the scope. So I'll, I'll, I'll look into it eventually. Ferry went into a long spiel about JFK's neck wound. So, yeah, he fired from the first shot from the grassy knoll and shot Kennedy in the throat. And then he walks back into uh, off into the pergola, right? So it's hilarious that he's saying this shit. In the course of his lectures on anatomy and pathology, he named every bone in the human body and every hard and soft muscle area. He talked extensively about the dermis and epidermis. Ferry said uh, if the same bullet that struck JFK in the back or neck uh, eventually struck Conley, that Conley or Kennedy had to be a contortionist. He then rattled off some more scientific information in regards to bones and skin on how a bullet decreased in speed when it strikes an object and how the same bullet could not have possibly caused all that damage. Ferry said that the question would never be answered because the doctor who performed the tra uh, tracheotomy had 10 thumbs and left unanswered the most important question of all time. Ferry then laughed and said that the doctors are almost as stupid as lawyers, but that lawyers are worse because they are always in your pocket. God. You got to read between the lines on what Ferry's saying here. <laughs> Jokes about the neck wound that he caused. I then said, in other words, Dave, you don't buy the one-shot theory. Ferry said he wasn't saying anything because he didn't want J. Edgar on his tail, that he had enough with Garrison to contend with. Ferry said that in time, he would work uh, the whole thing out and then laughingly said that he would contact our office. I noticed at this point that he was in a very good spirits and was laughing and joking and even commented that he's feeling pretty good now and that he had three cups of coffee already and hadn't thrown up yet. Ferry then received another phone call from Steve Littleton and his wife and joked with Littleton's wife about how he knew uh, that he had dated Lee Harvey, about how he knew that she had dated Lee Harvey Oswald and he was and he was going to tell Garrison on her. Uh, she must have told him that she had seen his picture in the paper and he replied that he didn't like it because it made him look unphotogenic. <laughs> what? David Fer Ferry worrying about being photo fucking genic. Hilarious. Um, she also must have asked Ferry if it was him uh, that some people identify with somebody or at some place. And he said, well, some people are mistaken or that he had a common face. After he hung up on the phone, we told him we had to leave. Ferry said that he had more to tell us about the one shot theory. We told him to save it for another day as it was dark already. And we had to meet Garrison. I then asked him if he would like to tell me some more about his trip to Hammond. And he smiled and said, go to hell. <laughs> Uh, I then asked if he stayed uh, with Clay Shaw. He said, who's Clay Shaw? I said, all right, if that doesn't ring a bell, how about Clay Bertrand? He said, who's Clay Bertrand? I said, Clay Bertrand and Clay Shaw are the same person. He asked, who's that? Who, I said, who said, he said, who said that? I said, Dean Andrews told us. He said, Dean Andrews might tell you guys anything. You know how Dean Andrews is. 
Ferry then startled, uh, started to go into another lecture, and we told him we had to go. He followed us down the stairs and walked down on the sidewalk with us. Ferry asked Ivan to be sure and call him. Ivan assured him he would, and we left. Great stuff. It's fucking great stuff, man. Great stuff. It was always in front of our face the whole time. Memorandum, February 15th, 1967, to Jim Garrison, District Attorney. Andrew Scambria, Assistant District Attorney. FBI investigations at the Finale Bar, 1041 Royal Street. Uh, upon talking with some of the employees of the Finale Bar, we have learned from them that two unidentified men had come into the bar asking for information about any Cuban refugees who may frequent the bar. Another person came to the bar with a picture of a Latin American type person, asked the person at the door if they had ever seen the person before. These people did not identify themselves to any of the employees, but merely came in, asked their questions, and left. The management told them that we have uh, been several inquiries in the last six to eight weeks regarding Latin Americans and Cubans and people who continually neglected to identify themselves. Hmm. Interesting. February 17th, 1967. Uh, to Jim Garrison from Lynn Loiselle. Latest listings in the telephone and city directories as to John Heindel, George Heindel, Meritis Gonzalez, also Bureau of Identification. So if you will recall from yesterday, um, in the brief time that we talked about uh, Heindel, Heindel, when questioned, said yes, that some people would call him Heidel when he was in the Marines, right? So um, what that means is we now have two people who've been whose names have been used in the assassination at one point or another that directly connect back to Lee Harvey Oswald's Marine group and names there, right? So we had the fucking interview with Mac Osborne, right? But uh, Leon Osborne was the name that Kerry Thornley gave to D Douglas Jones at Jones Printing when he had the flyers for Fair Play for Cuba Committee printed up to set up Lee Harvey Oswald, right? So that's Osborne there. And then we all know that allegedly Lee Harvey Oswald used the alias Alec Heidel. Heidel, now we can directly connect to John Heindel, who said that they used to call him that, or some people would call him that when he was in the Marines, right? So, uh, if you didn't watch yesterday's stream, you need to go back and watch it, because we talk about the Marines who knew Oswald, or possibly Kerry Thornley, who might have been impersonating Oswald in the Marines. Obviously, with the Marine Corps' fucking well-awareness, right? Mm. All right, this is just contact information for Heindel. Uh, shows him living in... Uh... Where the hell is that? It has to be Louisiana. Um, yes, uh, Algiers, Louisiana. It looks like George Heindel and John Heindel both lived at the 800 block. So I'm going to skip over this stuff. Um, this basically is Garrison attempting to connect. <laughs> so I think Garrison kind of started to get the drift here, right? So Garrison knew who Oswald was in the Marines with, and he had all the names. So when he starts seeing names that are duplicated later on in the investigation being used as like uh, aliases obviously then he probably knew what i'm suspecting is that carrie thornley was piecing together this fucking oswald legend in new orleans and he was using the names of people that he had known from the marines to do it Ooh, ooh. Wait, was there a streak of rebellion in carrie thornley was he doing that because he was fucking stupid or because he was planting the seeds of his own defense? Who knows? Subject, uh, Joseph Armilla. Louis Ivan and I interviewed Mrs. Uh, Thais MacArthur at her residence at 3305 Palmyra Street in this city on February 15th, 1967. The interview took place at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Mrs. MacArthur is the ex-wife of Joseph Armilla. They were divorced in March of 64. Joe Miller came to the United States from Guatemala City in October of 59. That same month, he married Theus. Um, he told his wife that he had been active in certain revolutionary activities in Guatemala while living there. Also, just prior to coming to the United States, he was employed by Aviateca Airline of Guatemala. Joe Miller was a close friend of Richard Ricardo Davis. 
According to Theus, Richard Davis was always talking about forming anti-Castro groups. So ultimately, let me just say it, these anti-Castro groups ultimately end up leading you fucking nowhere. Nowhere. Uh, the only relevance of the anti-Castro groups is that the uh, organization uh, Interpen, which was run by Jerry Hemming, who I cannot place really in in the in Dallas in this loop in the assassination. He knew all the guys involved for sure, but I just I have no, nothing that suggests that he was involved. If there was, I would say, but I just don't have it. But um, so Jerry Hemming run Interpen. And Interpen is where all of these fucking guys interacted, right? So you have all these guys, Ricardo Davis um, and um, Ralph Schlafter and a whole bunch of these fucks, right? And Lawrence Howard, um, Lauren Hall, William Seymour, right? Frank Sturgis. And eventually the hitmen ident identified only as Max uh, will all interact down in No Name Key. Max, of course, being one of many aliases of Jack Valente. So, um, uh, she also recalls his mentioning the name, uh, Loriano Batista. However, that Theus did not speak or understand Spanish. She was not privy to many of the conversations which took place in her presence. Uh, Theus MacArthur can only recall one meeting with Sergio Arcacha. This took place in the summer of 1962 when she and her husband were living on Arnold Road in Jefferson Parish. At this time, her husband operated a shell service station at the intersection of Arnold Road and Jefferson Highway. This seems to be the only extensive conversation with Arcacha. So here we have Sergi Arcacha Smith um, being uh, injected into this social circle involving obviously Richard fucking Davis, but I don't really associate Arcacha with any of the um activities down in no name key i can't place them there i can place them in fucking miami for sure because that's where they all get off the fucking boat um and that's where he originally got off the boat but i could never place him with those uh, mercenary types he was kind of one step ahead of that right or one step above that he was more the suit and tie guy the suit and tie cia front guy as opposed to get your hands dirty guy but then we have the uh clear-cut information on the raid at the bunker in Houma, Louisiana, um, where it clearly was Sergio Arcacha, Gordon Novell, Andrew Blackman, David Ferry, Leighton Martins. All these fucking guys broke into the bunker at Houma, right? And so, uh, yeah, so Sergio Arcacha clearly was the one guy who got his fucking hands dirty, which was shocking to me, really. Um, this goes to show how these guys can prevent, present to the world a, a civilized face and be fucking animals underneath. Let me see. Uh, this took place in the summer of 1962 uh, when she and her husband were living on Arnold Road in Jefferson Parish. At this time, her husband operated a shell service station at the intersection of Arnold Road and Jefferson Highway. Hmm. I wonder if that is the same service station that David Ferry ended up buying. This seems to be the only extensive conversation with Arkasha. So Mrs. MacArthur remembers when her husband borrowed a car belonging to Mary Catherine Regan for the purpose of transporting some Cubans to Miami. However, she cannot remember the specific date. The FBI contacted her when the car was later found in Miami. The car was never returned to New Orleans. This is probably the car that Joe Mia uh, sent the license plate for uh, Loriano Batista. Mrs. MacArthur could not identify the picture of, nor recall the names of the following David Ferry, Morris, Br Morris Brownlee, uh, Clay Shaw, and Angel Vega. So Brownlee, I, yeah, you know, Brownlee definitely used as an alias at some point. Um... It talks about how um, a, one of the documents says that Akacha's real name is Brownlee, which is not true. But perhaps there was a um, one of the kids was using um, Akacha as a as an alias, which wouldn't be a, a surprise considering Leighton Martins. Um, Leighton Martins um, for sure was close with Sergi Akacha, and so I could see him using that. Because uh, the description of him was that he had a flat top, right? A short flat top. And there was pictures of Leighton Martins with the fucking short flat top. So but who knows? Who gives a fuck? Um, Morris Brownlee. Odds are more than likely just an alias not to be really worried about. Um, Clay Shaw and Angel Vega. Angel Vega is another one. Out of, like, here's the deal. When you start coming across, like, overlapping 
uh, incidents, when you start coming across like certain names that jump to your jump out into the forefront, like William Seymour and Carrie Thornley and these guys, because their activities clearly indicate that they were heavily involved. Um, when I get to the lower level characters, Louis Rebel and fucking um, the pilot guy who got his uh, visa at the Mexican consulate that we talked about, like uh, David Magyar, right? David Magyar is another one. So um, like these fucking guys, like they pop up in such low capacity. I just don't. And then when I account for like who did what in Dallas, I can plug in all the fucking gaps. So I just don't really see a lot of these names that Garrison was so stuck on, uh, like Carlos Caroga. Or Manuel fucking um, whatever the fuck his last name was. Um, like, I just, these names really just never surfaced. And when you think about what how they would keep an assassination attempt to the innermost of innermost circles, you know, it makes sense. Like, these guys had to have had friends, and that's all these fucking people were. Uh, but yeah, this, this, I can tell you, there's like tens of thousands of pages wasted on these fucking guys. And anything referenced anti Castro Cuban in the Kennedy assassination, completely fucking waste of paper. Um, Thais recalls vaguely her husband talking about a plywood venture in Guatemala. Uh, that sounds like it's right up Clay Shaw's alley. Uh, however, she did not know that her husband was the president of the Guatemala Lumber Yard and Mineral Corporation, nor has she heard of the names of Gus de la Bar and Frank de la Bar. Uh, additionally, she had never heard of the existence of any training camp on the other side of Lake Pontchartrain. She had a wedding picture of her husband, but no pictures of Richard Davis or anyone else of interest in the investigation, so that's fucking hilarious hilarious she vaguely recalls that her husband talking about a plywood venture in guatemala how she had she did not know that her husband was the president of the guatemalan lumber and mineral corporation that's fucking funny that's because he was a spy right so that's how it is the, the, the spouses never know nothing uh, february 20th 67th uh from alcock to jim garrison reference Ampala rocha Ah, here we are, getting some Sergio Arcacha stuff, connecting Carrie Thornley, because we're in the Carrie Thornley files, to Sergio Arcacha, um, who was uh, involved in the Rochermi incident, and then would go on to be, by my suspicions, uh, I'm 99% that he was the shooter on the roof of the book depository where he left the Mauser 765. Um, Andrew Scambria and I interview Mrs. Rocha at her residence at 4706 Duplices Street in the city on February 16th, 1967. The interview took place at 7 p.m. Mrs. Rocha was second consul of the Cuban consulate here until January 4th, 1960. Carlos Marquez was the first consul until he left here shortly after Fidel Castro assumed power on January 1st of 1959. Uh, with his departure, Mrs. Rocha assumed command of the consulate until she left. Mrs. Rocha knew Sergio Arcacha fairly well. Like most Cubans interviewed to date, she came to dislike him. Mrs. Rocha also knew Clay Shaw, but only through a business relationship. She was not too fond of him since he insisted on the Cuban government owed him unpaid rent since after January 4th of 1960. Uh, it was Mrs. Rocha's position that since diplomatic relations with Cuba was severed by the United States and the consulate ordered closed the yearly lease, which was renewed on January 1st, 1960, should have been automatically terminated. However... Clay Shaw felt otherwise and seized and sold the consulate furniture to pay the rent he claimed was due. What a fucking cunt. Uh, Mrs. Rocha never saw Clay in the company of Arcacha. Further, when she left the consulate on January 4th, 1960, she never returned. She was not active in any anti-Castro organization since, as she said, she was completely preoccupied with earning a living. She could not identify nor... Has she heard of David Ferry, Morris Brownlee, or Guy Bannister? She frankly told us that she was somewhat disappointed in her fellow Cubans because of their constant factionalism and inability to organize. It seemed that everyone wanted to be a leader, and as a result, nothing constructive was ever accomplished. Holy fuck, you couldn't sum up that entire anti-Castro Cuban movement better than that paragraph. That was it right there. When we first arrived at her residence, Mrs. Roja... Uh, showed us a letter from the State Department of the United States under the signature of Andrew Brenneman, uh, attorney for that department. This letter essentially asked her to turn over the consulate records in her possession to the Czechoslovakian government. The letter explained that this procedure was necessary since the United States had no diplomatic relations with Castro, uh, with Castro's Cuba. The records, of course, would ultimately be funneled 
to Cuba through Czechoslovakian government. Uh, these records, which were all in Spanish, consisted principally of birth dates, marriages, deaths, and statistics of that nature. At this time, Mrs. Rocha will not let us look at the records. Also, she is an adamant in her refusal to turn them over to the Czechoslovakian government. All right, James Llewellyn. He's another one of David Ferry's guys. February 20, 1967, Jim Garrison, District Attorney, James L. Alcock, District Attorney, uh, reference James Llewellyn. Okay, so in my opinion, James Llewellyn, who was working at a car rental dealership at the place, I think he provided a bunch of the cars in New Orleans. The guys drove to Dallas. Uh, like the light blue Ford Falcon. What else? At least that minimum, the light blue Ford Falcon. Uh, actually, that might be the only one. But sure shit, I guarantee James Llewellyn hooked David Ferry up with that car because that, that car came up out of nowhere and disappeared into the ether. So on February 19th, 1967, about one o'clock, Louis Ivan and I interviewed James Llewellyn. The interview took place in Ivan's office in the presence of George Piazza, attorney at law, who accompanied Llewellyn. James Llewellyn is working for the Boeing Company and at president is on loan to the Mississippi Test Site Center. Uh-huh. I guarantee he's not. That's a CIA cover. Uh, he is residing at 4406 Paris Avenue with his mother. James Llewellyn, who henceforth will be referred to as J.L., is originally from Cleveland, Ohio. It is there that he first met David Ferry, uh, who will henceforth be identified as the initials D.F. J.L. met D.F. at the Municipal Airport in Cleveland, Ohio, sometime in January 1948. At this time, D.F. was an instructor at a Benedictine Catholic high school. Let me say that again. A Benedictine Catholic high school. That's very important. Who else went to that high school? Also, at this time, David Ferry owned a stint in 150 Voyager and was training student pilots on weekends. As uh, Llewellyn recalls, Ferry's father was an attorney. In May of 1953... Uh, Llewellyn came to New Orleans from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Fucking Tulsa again. Jesus Christ with these fucking spy cities. At this time, David Ferry was in the city and had corresponded with, uh, uh, with Llewellyn. Upon his arrival to the city, Llewellyn moved into an apartment on Clay Street in Kenner, Louisiana with David Ferry and Roy Berger and Joe D'Antonio. Uh, the latter two individuals are presently employed by Eastern Airlines. Uh, Llewellyn also said that Ferry had brought a stints in 150 from Cleveland to New Orleans. Um, Llewellyn at this time was employed by Eastern as a ramp agent. Eastern as a ramp agent. So a shady guy has a job as a ramp agent. Hmm. Makes you wonder how they got the fucking knives and the gun and shit onto the planes on 9-11, right? Uh, in December 1954, uh, Llewellyn moved from David Ferry's apartment to an address on Jade Street. In May 1955, Llewellyn went on air cadet training until October 1956. Upon his return to New Orleans, he lived in on Phosphor in Metairie, Louisiana, and worked for Avis's Rent-A-Car. In June 1957, Llewellyn moved to an address on Madison Street in the French Quarter of the city and roomed with a man by the name of Bruce Edwards sometime in early 58. Llewellyn moved to 1309 Dauphine Street. See, all these fucking guys at one time or another live on Dauphine Street. It's at this time that uh, Llewellyn met Clay Shaw. The meeting was very casual and consisted principally of neighborly greetings when the two met near their apartments. In November of 1958, uh, Llewellyn went on active duty with the Air Force until May 59. Upon his return from active duty, Llewellyn resided at 622 Vermilion Boulevard in this city. Uh, with William Munson and his family. Munson and Llewellyn purchased a Republic CB aircraft, uh, which they were going to refurbish and sell. In December 59, Llewellyn moved to 1501 Westbrook in, in with his sister. This address is in the Parkchester Apartments. Sometime in 1960, Llewellyn moved back to 1309 Dauphine Street, where he resided until the spring of 1964. During this time, uh, Llewellyn was employed at various jobs, including that of driving a cab, working for Avis Rent-A-Car, and National Rent-A-Car. Also during this time, Llewellyn recalls having been invited to Clayshaw's apartment for a drink. The only person present on this occasion were Clayshaw himself and Clayshaw's maid. 
Llewellyn has never seen Clay Shaw with David Ferry, nor has he ever heard Clay Shaw or David Ferry refer to any other person in the conversa in any conversation. During this time, Llewellyn saw David Ferry in his words, quote, infrequently. Llewellyn cannot recall David Ferry mentioning anything about the Cuban situation or his feelings thereon. During this period, uh, JL met with Morris Brownlee at uh, David Ferry's house. He also met with met either at David Ferry's house or at the airport and through David Ferry, uh, the following people. Melvin Coffey, Leighton Martins, Al Bobuf, Guy Bannister, Thomas Compton, Richard Marshall, and Eric Crochet. So, let's pause right here. I'm currently in the process of wrapping up this chapter on Rose Jeremy. Rose Jeremy involves two guys, Sergio Caccia, Emilio Santana, driving with this fucking hooker, and uh, she's a pain in the ass, so they basically... Uh, say fuck off bitch and she gets thrown out of the silver slipper lounge which is the bar they were hanging out at they take off she gets she's drunk and on heroin and she fucking stumbles in the road gets hit by a fucking car goes to the fucking hospital says Kennedy's gonna get killed nobody believes her ends up in the mental ward right whole story attached to that I'm finishing the chapter on that and in that I talk about a letter that David Ferry wrote to somebody that the FBI labeled under the code name Blackstone in reference to the heroin that was coming in that Rose Jeremy, Sergio Arcacha, and uh, Emilio Santana were supposed to pick up. Okay, In this letter, the Dear Bastard letter, as it is known, David Ferry is writing to uh, Andrew Blackman, and he's talking about this porn that they had, because uh, back then, when you had porn, it was on 8mm fucking film, right? Like, you didn't have no Pornhub. So, um... Going to your buddy's house with a wheel-to-reel fucking uh, projector was their 1963 version of Pornhub, right? So um, he's talking about how uh, they watched this video, him and Jimmy, right? And him and Jimmy, and they let the cum fly, right? And so Jimmy is James Llewellyn, who this guy's talking about. And that letter was dated in 1960 fucking two. So uh, Llewellyn is lying about his associations with David Ferry at this time, okay? So just keep that in mind. So Llewellyn met and introduced Dante Marancini, which end up being just another fucking alias that's used, okay? So forget about that. Alvin Bobuf uses Dante Marancini as a fucking alias. Although Dante Marancini, I believe, did work at the Riley Coffee Company. Not the Ryder Coffee. Well, maybe it was the Ryder Coffee Company. And then ended up going to work for Mashad, which is a division of fucking Lockheed, which is fucking the CIA, okay? Whenever you talk about military-industrial complex, you're talking CIA shit and army military stuff, so... Uh, so yeah, Dante Marchini, mostly an alias, so kind of irrelevant. Dante was born in Brooklyn, New York, resided there until he was about four years old. At the time, his father took the family back to Italy, where he remained until he was approximately 27 years of age. During the Second World War, he was confined to a prison camp. Uh, Dante now resides on Music Street with his wife and three or four son and three sons. Dante's wife is from El Salvador. Um, their telephone numbers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Llewellyn at one time introduced Dante to Clay Shaw. Dante is presently employed by the Chrysler Corporation at the Michaud plant. Yeah, there we go. I, I knew I was knew what I was talking about. But no, Michaud is... Um, Michaud's a city. And also in fucking Michaud, there was um, Lockheed and a whole bunch of other places. So when you say that you're at the Chrysler Corporation at Michaud, I just don't buy it. That's a fucking cover. Uh, remember, he worked at the fucking coffee house, which was a CIA front job. So give me a fucking break. Um, Llewellyn recalls that in the summer of 63, he was working for the National Car Rental Company. And that he introduced his supervisor, Larry Stulig, to Clay Shaw at the International Trademark. This meeting was arranged by Llewellyn for the purpose of Nationals establishing a phone outlet at the International Trademark. This and perhaps one other occasion are the only other times that Llewellyn recalls being in the vicinity of the trademark. Llewellyn was unable to identify the photographs of the following people. Um, all right. The only names that are relevant on here are Emilio Santana, Sergi Arcacha, and I guess you could throw Carlos Brinier in there also. Um, Llewellyn recalls an incident in the spring of 1962 where he saw a Latin type and Dia and David Ferry standing by Ferry's airplane. Uh, yeah, the Latin type was, um, was it Magyar? David Magyar? I believe it was. He was introduced to the Latin but did not engage in any conversation with him. He recalls the Latin spoke few words of English but not engaged in a lengthy conversation with him. Is unable to say how well he spoke English. The Latin was of olive complexion, about five foot seven inches tall, with stocky build, appearing to be about twenty five years of age. He had black hair and was wearing casual attire. This is the only time that he recalled seeing Ferry with any Latin or Spanish type. 
About two or three days after the assassination, David Ferry called Llewellyn and asked him to come to his apartment on Louisiana Avenue Parkway. Ferry wanted, Louis, uh, wanted Llewellyn to help him look for any pictures or memoranda relating to Lee Harvey Oswald. At this time, there were two FBI agents in Ferry's apartment. They spoke briefly to, to Llewellyn in his car about his association with David Ferry. The interview uh, was general, and neither agent took any notes. Uh, Llewellyn and Ferry were unable to find any pictures or written memoranda uh, which would place Lee Harvey Oswald in David Ferry's CAP unit. Llewellyn says that he has not seen or spoken to David Ferry in about six months to a year. They had a falling out over the use of an air coupe airplane used by, uh, owned by Llewellyn and uh, William Munson. Ferry had flown this plane, which had a range of about 400 miles at night against the wishes of Llewellyn and Munson. This flight took place sometime in 1965. Oh, okay. So, um... All right, so we're going to leave it here for today, and we're going to pick off, pick up tomorrow right here um, on page 31. So thank you for tuning in, and I will see you all then.